So with that, I am going to uh, go ahead and turn it over to Don, and uh, he can get started, and uh, hopefully John will uh, join us uh, shortly. And uh, with that, uh, Don, go ahead. The uh, floor is yours. Okay, super. Thank you, Ken. As anybody can, everybody can see tower work, some tips and techniques and some tools. It's going to be uh, <clears throat> interesting. The uh, uh, without John, he and I have uh, actually practiced this a little bit and had, uh, you know, the usual handoff or give and take sort of thing. And without him, it's going to be sort of comical probably, because uh, I'll probably change the slide and go, why isn't Crivelli talking? But anyway, uh, it's going to be observations from nearly 100 years of tower work. We'll talk about some things that you should do and some things you should avoid, or planning is the key to success when you're doing tower work. What will the talk cover? Well, or what we hope that you'll gain by listening to us, we want you to think about safety. Uh, that's our predominant message. It just might just save your life or at least prevent an injury. We'll present some ways that you can save some time and money. Obviously, uh, time is money in, in terms of labor. You probably already know a lot of these things, but some of them hopefully will be new to you. We'll talk about some things that we often see. That means some do's and some don'ts. Those are common mistakes and how to avoid them. As I said, safety is the primary watchword here. It's all too often taken for granted by hams or not even considered at all. Uh, it's always surprising to get to a client location and you know they're running around with no hard hat, that sort of thing. You should always remember that no job is so important that it has to be done in an unsafe manner, really. It's, the safety always comes first. Tower work is very dangerous, as you know. Uh, of course, if you, you know, follow along with the headlines, you can see that uh, it's sometimes classified as the most dangerous job in America per capita, and that's probably true. So you should always keep in mind that you don't want to rush or try to get crazy when you're doing something because no tower work is worth doing something in an unsafe manner. We want to always look at a, product, a project with safety in mind, and this is, of course, one of those handoff moments where Mr. Cavelli, who's sitting in a rehab hospital here in this photograph, operating ARRL field day, but uh, he was injured. I uh, had a tower fall over with him, 40 feet of 45G with him on it, and uh, up in, in Maine. And uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try to list all the things that were broken or damaged or whatever, but uh, if you look carefully, you can see the body brace there, and uh, he was. Uh, Lucky. He's actually very lucky to be alive, quite frankly. But uh, 90 days later, he was back at it, back working again. So, uh, which is very good, of course. But uh, obviously, uh, he could tell you a, a little bit more about the detail about the accident. The important point is, you know, John's been doing this a long time. He's been doing this as long as I have. And even though, you know, we each know, quote unquote, what we're doing, or we're supposed to, or we think we do, or however you want to phrase that. He had an accident because, as we all know, accidents cannot really be planned for, which is why you need to think safety at all times. In ham radio, we don't have a government regulating body like OSHA when it comes to climbing, but it's up to each of us to learn and understand and follow safe practices and avoid risks. For, thing, for example, things if you feel uncomfortable, you don't climb. And you find someone with experience or you hire a professional to do your work for you. Pretty simple common sense sort of things. Most of these safety rules are common sense rules, but again, you can't, you know, not remember you can't remember them at all at all times. Here are some common sense safety tips. You don't climb a tower without wearing safety gear. That means a belt or preferably a PFAS, personal fall arrest safety harness. And you should always wear good shoes. You should wear that gear even for a short climb. So the other, the other day, I climbed up 10 feet, and I put the harness on, and the client said, do you really need that? You know, which I thought was kind of odd. But I pointed out to him that when I got to 10 feet, I was going to be using both hands. So you have to have the safety gear on, even on a short climb. You should never climb alone. At a minimum, you always want to have someone you know, who knows when you're going to be on the tower. And it's always best, of course, to have a ground person there right on site, preferably with a cell phone, et cetera. It's best if you don't climb in bad weather, unless it's absolutely necessary. 
I can't tell you how many times I've gone up N4ZC's tower in the middle of the night in snowstorms and rainstorms because somebody jammed the tail twister into the stop. But you want to try to avoid that kind of thing if at all possible. John and I have each been licensed for 50 years, so we do have quite a bit of experience. That isn't necessarily a long time, but for some clients that it is. Uh, but the point of that is that we've each gained some first-hand exposure in building, erecting, or repairing just about any kind of tower antenna type that's available out there. And we want to share that experience with you tonight, at least uh, in the brief period of time that we've got with you. It is a real good uh, marketing ploy, of course, to say you've got that kind of experience. All right, let's consider some things that we encounter in our work. One of them, we'll start at the tower base. Uh, one of the things we often encounter is folks saying, well, I'm going to mount my tower base below grade because that way if I ever move, I can cut the tower off, right, you know, and, and throw some dirt over it. No one will even know there's a tower ever been here. Uh, well, the con of that, of course, is that if you have that kind of tower base, you can't leave it unattended. This is a Roan 45G, 80 feet. client was a little excited when I told him I wasn't about going to climb it. Uh, all, all two of the legs are completely rusted through, and two of the Z brace, uh, Z braces were gone. So, uh, in, in that, you know, in that situation, that tower is obviously unsafe to climb, and that's, you know, what can happen. He had, you know, lawn debris to be collected there for 28 years. Obviously, collected moisture, and the legs just simply dissolve. And, you know, hard to believe, 45G, but there it is. Hey, Don. I, and I encounter that a lot. Uh, if I had, you know, a couple dollars for every one of these kind of tower bases that I encountered, I could be happily ensconced in the Caribbean, I'm sure. <laughs> we never use hardware store items for tower guying. This is an actual turnbuckle I took off a of Ham's tower. Uh, you'll notice that the I ends or the eyes on the turnbuckle are just simply rolled. They're not forged, and. Uh, I've had people complain to me when I say we're going to replace those, but I did have an actual instance at N4UHs where his uh, turnbuckle, exact, this isn't his, but it was exactly like this, and it did unroll, and uh, it, it disappeared. And he, of course, couldn't believe that the guy wire is completely gone. I found the end of it 40 feet up in a tree, but they will unroll. I've, I've actually experienced it, so you never want to use something like this. You never want to get to 200 feet and find this either. Uh, this is hardware that is not load rated. It's just a, 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 a link, you know, a, a link that you put into a piece of chain. It's not load rated. Obviously, that's not the kind of thing you want to find up at the top of the tower holding, you know, one of the guy wires. The uh, solution Don, here. I have, I, I have, I have, I have joined you. Oh, good. Very good. And you sound fine, bud. Thanks. Uh, the solution here, of okay. course, is to use a shackle, uh, attaching you know your preform to the tower guy bracket. Here are some examples of thimbles and shackles. We're going to talk about them in the lower right corner. You see that's the, uh, of course, what's called an anchor shackle, and it's a screw pin design. We'll be talking about that here in a little bit in detail. And uh, you'll notice the in the uh, upper left, those are thimbles. Those are what are known as heavy duty thimbles. You'll notice there's a distinct difference here in a minute just so you get some idea. All this stuff is hot dip galvanized hardware, of course. Not available at the local hardware store, but you know, available from Roan. It's available from various importers as well. And again, we can talk about that in detail. Here's some uh, incorrect and correct thimble examples. A lot of folks don't understand this. Uh, for instance, let's take our typical quarter inch EHS, uh, which, which is what we have here. You've got a piece of uh, pre quarter inch preform. So somebody might say, well, I need a quarter inch thimble then. And they run to the hardware store and they find, oh, here's some quarter inch thimble and a blister pack and it's 69 cents. That's a good thing. But as you can see, not only does it not engage and the, and the preform has been rolled together so the diameter is as small as it's going to get, that you can see that the thimble does not engage in the preform loop. And, uh, You'll notice also that the nose of it is decidedly different than the heavy-duty thimble. It's very pointed because that's a, that's a thimble that's designed to be used on a piece of rope. 
The proper size thimble is at least two sizes larger than the piece of steel that you're going to engage. So if you're going to use a quarter inch thimble, you'd want to have at least a, a 7 sixteenths, which is what this is at the bottom. And that's, of course, you'll see that the nose is a little bit more rounded, and it's designed to allow that uh, preform or that piece of guy wire to move a little bit. Because there is the, the load that the guy wire puts on a tower is, of course, a dynamic load. It does move. Proper way, we still see people using Crosby clips or cable clamps, as they're generically known, in the incorrect fashion, uh, which is, you know, surprising in this day and age because it's, you know, been out, the, the, the monomic device, never saddle a dead horse, has been out there forever. But the bottom one, of course, is the correct one. And you'll see that the saddle, there's a U-bolt U portion of the, of the clamp, and then there's a saddle portion of the clamp. And the saddle only goes on the live side, i.e., the piece of cable that's running away from the guy point or away from the attachment point, back toward you know, the anchor or back up to the tower. The saddle only goes on that side. So let's uh, switch over to GD and let him talk about some first steps. OK. <clears throat> Well, good evening, everybody. I'm sorry I uh, had a few uh, technical difficulties out here on Long Island, but uh, thanks to Panera Bed, I have a, I have a connection. Um, anyway, when we uh, when we go to do, we deal with our clients, we uh, try to give them some consulting, and and one of the things we like to say is this is you're not putting up a tower, you're not putting up an antenna, you're putting up a system. So you have to think about okay, is this is this your first antenna? Are you going to have more? Are you going to have uh, what's going to happen over time? So we try to help help our clients develop a conceptual design and come up with a budget for that design. I mean, we're not all made out of money. Some of us are, I suppose, and some of us aren't. But uh, there are limits to everything. So something that's reasonable. So what are the, some of the considerations? What kind of a station are you trying to put up? Is it going to be a single op station, a multi single, multi multi? Are you just a DXer and want to get uh, maximum uh, bang for the buck for DXing. There are, there are many, many different uh, opportunities here. Next slide. All right. First thing, first thing you do, first thing you do is you have to assume you're going to need some kind of permit, at least in the United States. Now, I know we have folks on here from many other countries. We don't, I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to know what, what you go through to put up a tower let's say, in, in, uh, in, in Russia or in Slovakia or wherever. But here in the United States, um, our government uh, gets very busy and in, in involved with uh, when we want to put uh, pieces of uh, steel or aluminum in the air. Uh, our neighbors sometimes object to uh, having what they consider an eyesore. Anyway, you should do your homework. Um, here in the States, we have a, we have a wonderful reference. Uh, Fred Holmgarden, K1VR, has a wonderful book out there called uh, Antenna Zoning for Amateur Radio. It is the premier book on the subject. Uh, when you do talk to your local officials, of course, you should be interactive with them, um, pleasant. Um, try to, you know, obviously make your case without being being obnoxious. And and of course, we're not talking about towers. We're talking about antenna structures. Try to use that phrase rather than tower. Towers are just red flags. Okay, go ahead, Don. Used versus new. This comes up quite often because, as John said, not everyone's a millionaire and not everyone's made out of money. And people are always asking me, how do I know that this tower is a bargain? Or how do I know that it's worth pursuing? And it's a very good question. It's uh, certainly relevant. You have to know what is or was not a bargain. Uh, one of the things, of course, you can do just in terms of talking about or thinking about price is to check some of the prices that are on some of the sites like QTH.com or eham.net. For instance, if we don't know, you know whether a piece of Roan 45 or 25, is, which is tubular tower, is going to be you know, suitable you can, you know, seek, seek advice from John or myself or someone else, uh, you know, take a look at the tower, take a look at some photographs. Basically, uh, new is nice, but being practical is a good idea as well. And, you know, the old adage of it seems that the deal is too good to be true, well, it probably is. 
there's a common factor that people an, another error that people make, and that's they assume too much. Hardware always has physical limits. For the tower, especially if you're going to put up a crank-up tower, uh, there's going to be you know, a limit to how much load, wind load, that the tower can sustain. The mast itself, of course, even the rotator. Those are all things that are often overlooked. They're not taken into consideration at all. For larger antenna array designs, you should probably spend the money and have a professional engineer do an analysis and get some approval. Uh, I just had a question come up the other day. A person sent me a you know a note and said, "Can I put? I'm going to put up an, a 45G tower. Can I put all these antennas on the tower?" He says, "I've only got you know I, I I saw the little note at the top that says I can use X amount of wind load, but I want to put other antennas down below." So of course you know we had to go through the explanation as to what those numbers mean in the Roan catalog and so on. Again, you never want to underestimate Mother Nature. Folks are often asking if I can really build for ice and or wind. And the answer to that is a guarded yes, but the outcome is always uncertain, meaning that you can never really predict what's going to happen with ice and or wind. Uh, yes, you can, you can predict you know, the, the, the ice. You can say that the antenna is going to be ra ra rated, rated, say, for a half inch of radial ice. And that's all well and good, but what happens? You know, when that the the real problem isn't when the antenna is fully coated with ice. This is a often a surprise to, to folks, but the point is when the antenna when the ice comes off the antenna is when the problems arise, because the ice almost invariably never comes off symmetrically. I.e., the the, the the ice doesn't simply fall off one director, two directors, then the reflector, then the driven element. It falls off of one side usually first, meaning that the antenna is now dramatically overloaded on one side. And if you get some wind, things, you know, again, very uncertain, unpredictable as to what's going to happen, how things are going uh, to fail. But uh, one can try. One can certainly try to build for ice and wind. And it's, you know, if you, if depending on where you live geographically, if you, you know, live in Florida, you know, things are going to be different if you live in Colorado, for instance. So you should take those kinds of things into consideration. All right, the tower itself. Go ahead, GD. Okay. Well, we, we talked about having a plan. You know, how many towers, how many antennas, what are you going to do? Think, you got to think the future. Because where you put that first tower may influence where you want to put the second tower. Uh, we did a lot of work at NR5M in, in, in years past, and we found that the towers weren't always optimally spaced, but they were already existing, so we worked with what we had. But if you have a, have a blank sheet paper, like K9CT did, um, you can lay it out and optimize everything. So size does matter. You know, wind load will drive what kind of tower you put up, and certainly you want to use the best materials you can afford. Um, budget will govern physical limits. You know, if you're talking uh, run 25 versus 45 or 55, depending on the arrays you're putting up there, you may want to have that run 55 for security. And always comply with the manufacturer's specifications. Now, fortunately, Roan has had the foresight of probably building in a very large safety factor in their specs. And that's pretty evident because people generally overload their Roan towers. And even in ice storms and wind storms, they still seem to stay, stay up, even through uh, the proverbial Hurricane Hugo. But again, do your best to stay within the limits specified by the manufacturer. Okay. We talked about hardware before. We've been talking about a lot of hardware. But the big deal is buy the right stuff. Don't buy junk. We saw the examples of the turnbuckles and the and the thimbles before, um, even even the Crosby clips. You can go to a go to a hardware store and buy a 79 cent Crosby clip that's going to rust rust to nothing in a matter of a matter of a year or two. You want to buy good galvanized materials. So Don's going to talk a little bit here more about hardware. Go ahead, Don. All right, guying materials. There are only three choices. Three choices, only three choices. They are EHS, extra high strength steel, 
not aircraft cable, Philly strand or polygon rod. Polygon rod is not as well known as the other two, but those are basically your three choices. You never use plat now. Please accept uh, our word that we've seen all of the following things used to guide guide towers. So we're putting it in here and just saying and telling you never to use plastic covered clothesline cable, bailing wire, TV hard line, black dacon dacron rope or any type of rope for that matter for tower guide. Preform guide grips made by the Preform Line Products Company. They are the preferred choice for cable connections. They are available for all of the three choices. They are available for EHS, they are available for Philly strand, and they are available for polygon rod. Cable clamps, again, if used, please install them correctly. Again, we see that all the time that they are not installed correctly. We often suggest to people, in fact, 99.9% .9 of the time, that if you have an antenna that does have a truss system on it, that you use Philly strand instead of steel or rope for that purpose. One, one, one other comment about preforms. Yes, they are more expensive, significantly more expensive than a cable clamp, but they are much, much stronger. Yes, and they're much faster, much faster to install a preform than it, than it is to, you know, tighten up all those silly little uh, nuts on, on cable clamps. And invariably, people don't realize that cable clamps should be at least tested, or not tested, but examined at least once a year. And quite often, those are in an in ex inaccessible place once you've installed them. So another good reason not to use them. Turnbuckles. We like to use only heavy-duty galvanized turnbuckles. And size matters here meaning that longer is better. We like to use 12 inch long half inch diameter turnbuckles and I've been using Chinese hardware to Chinese turnbuckles. I've been using it for a long time, about 20 years as a matter of and over 20 years in fact. It's uh, significantly less expensive than something you can buy from uh, Roan Supplier or Texas Towers or some of those folks, but I've had no failures and I see no problem in using it. Again, you use quality turnbuckles on your antenna truss supports as well. I'm always disappointed to see, you know, a truss system on an antenna and using a turnbuckle with three inches, you know, that's three inches of, of take up. That's just simply not, not enough. Or, or it's a piece of aluminum, uh, aluminum. Or it's an aluminum body right. with a piece of plate, with plated steel hardware. Again, it'll rust up in very short order. Thimbles and shackles, again, items under, misunderstood, often overlooked. John mentioned we've done a lot of work at NR5M. When we first got to NR5M, and this is not anything other than a simple declarative sentence, there were no thimbles anywhere on any of the towers. Was, there were simply no thimbles any, in use anywhere. Uh, they just simply didn't know. So again, you use only heavy-duty thimbles. You don't use the rope thimbles that you find at the hardware store. And you should not hammer the thimbles onto your turnbuckles or the EQ plates. You use a shackle to make that connection. Encounter that a lot as well. The anchor shackle, of course, is the, the screw pin style is preferred. It's the easiest to work with. And you use those shackles at the guy bracket, at the EQ plate, and the turnbuckle guy cable connection. Uh, quite often, if you've beaten them on there with a hammer, uh, if you need to make a modification or a change, you can't do so because you simply can't, you know, take the guy cable apart. It's uh, pretty frustrating. Here's an example of using some of that Philly strain as a truss support system. This is on a on a Monster IR for an element support, and you can use on the new Philly strain. You can use a Nyco press tool and a Nyco press fitting. That's just a simple, quick example of that. All right, mass material. Go ahead. Okay. Um, generally speaking, there are there are two preferred mass tubing, and it's not it's not pipe. It's tubing. Forty one thirty chromoly, generally quarter inch wall or larger, or drawn over mandrel. These are both rated uh, generally in, around a well the the uh, chromoly is rated about a hundred thousand foot pounds, 
the DOM is probably about 80,000 foot-pounds if it's a good quality tubing. They, you can find this stuff. Uh, I don't know if I think Texas Towers is still selling it. Uh, I know Ray Solutions was carrying it for quite a while. And I'm sure there are many other local suppliers that you can find this, these materials from, too. And in today's world where the shipping is getting extremely expensive, if you can find something locally, do so. Aluminum, 6061T6 alloys, quarter inch or half inch wall. Um, I, I, I actually like using this because of the weight factor. It's a lot easier as an installer to put up an aluminum uh, mast than it is a steel mast. However, it, they do have their limits. Um, it's not as rated as highly as steel, and, never, and, and you have to be careful. For BHF, UHF arrays, it's perfectly fine. Water pipe. Don't even think about it. This isn't 1970 anymore, as Don pointed out here in this slide. There are better materials readily available to you, and this is just not the, the proper thing. Water pipe is just that pipe. It's not made for lateral forces. Exactly. Again, if I had a dollar for every piece of bent water pipe I removed, right. boy, I'd be in great shape. Thrust bearing. Now we have, I'm sure we're going to have some frequently asked questions, so we're going to try to nip those in the bud right here. This is an example of a Roan TB3, which is the two-inch di two diameter thrust bearing. Don't ask why Roan came up with this, these designators. The three-inch diameter is the TB4, but anyway. Uh, the, TB3, the TB series versus the machine shop is what we want to talk about here. Notice, notice in this picture, those are, those, are, those are stainless steel bolts in there. Go back. Right. The TB series bearings are lightweight because it's, it's an aluminum, cast aluminum uh, bearing frame or shell. And it's designed to carry ham radio loads. There are some potential problems. Uh, I've seen instances of the case cracking. That was pretty rare. I've only seen that once. It was definitely uh, an overloaded bearing that had uh, almost 1,000 pounds on it. Uh, one of the first things we always do when we get them is replace the collar bolts with stainless steel bolts to help uh, prevent the similar metal corrosion. Again, if you've been 200 feet in the air trying to get the thing apart, uh, you'll know what we're talking about. And one of the big problems that you, you encounter, especially among hams who are, have big arrays, is you get something called metal migration. There are, the ball bearings in the TB series bearings are steel ball bearings, of course. And again, it's an aluminum race. So if you've got a big array, i.e., you know, a 40 meter and a 20 or a 40 and a couple of tens or something, up on the tower, you don't want to leave that antenna parked in one place for a long period of time because it gently rocks back and forth in the wind and those steel ball bearings will move a little bit and they'll move a little bit and they'll move a little bit and they will actually push metal, the, the softer aluminum metal out in front of the bearing and you'll get a, an actual divot in the race. And you will find that the, you know, it doesn't take much to stop something like a tail twister or even some, uh, some or Orion or some prosistels. And they'll hit that divot and yeah, they just, it just won't go. And of course you go, well, gee, what's wrong? And it's just a simple case of metal migration. It's simply a, a, a problem of having a, met, a, a steel ball in an aluminum race. So, you know, once a month you move the antennas 20, 30 degrees and, you know, there are no problems. That is, the, that is the most common failure. Okay, we're at the machine shop bearing question here. Now, we have a before and after picture here. These are, this is a K4 ATX bearing who's probably sitting out there uh, in the audience. And this is a machine shop bearing. These are actually still supplied by a number of manufacturers. Uh, they're quite common in the crank-up tower world, as a matter of fact. And... Uh, they were just simply never designed to be used out of doors. Now, I don't know how many years Kim had had the bearing in the top picture up and in place, but uh, it was a bear to get that collar off because he had, a, he had left the, uh, I wasn't involved in the original installation, but he had left the original Allen headset screw in the collar. And over time, once that thing rusts, that Allen headset screw rusts into place. And again, it's not fun to be at the top of the tower with a drill trying to get that out of there. 
So uh, it's it's a problem. Now there now the solution that I've come up with or the the approach to solving this problem is to put a couple two or three coats of Rust-Oleum primer, red Rust-Oleum primer onto that bearing and then a top coat uh, that'll mitigate any rust issues, uh, and then you, of course you throw away the Allen head set screw, put a hex head bolt in there, and you can sort of, you know, if you're lucky, prevent the collar from rusting in place. It is a greased bearing; it has a zerk fitting right there on the side. So at least once or maybe twice a year, you should climb to the top of the tower wherever this bearing is located with a grease gun and indeed lubricate this bearing. But uh, this. The lower bearing, he's uh, he soaked it in vinegar and cleaned it all up. Did a great job, and uh, it's been outside up on the tower now for at least uh, three months. And I just looked at it over the weekend, and it still looks like it looks in that bottom picture. So you do have a fighting chance with these, but you can't just accept them as they're supplied and and, and expect not to have problems. All right, a little bit about nuts and bolts. You've got a lot of choices out there to choose from. Typically, you've got hot dip galvanized hardware, you've got stainless steel hardware, you've got the typical solution of a split washer and a nut versus a nylock nut, and we'll want to talk a little bit about proper tightening techniques, and we want to caution you, you see this all the time, people get, you know, some anti-seize, and it, it sort of goes to their head, you know, they, they, they just go crazy with it. I have a client, one client who puts it on with a paintbrush. Uh, you use anti-seize typically on stainless steel hardware to prevent galling, but you only need a little bit, uh, just a little bit, and it makes more sense. I've written about this extensively uh, in the NCJ column, for example, but you put the anti-seize on the nut, not on the threads. It's much harder to do, but that's where it does the most good. Hot dip galvanized hardware, of course, it's available from places like McMaster Car. Some smaller sizes available from like Lowe's and Home Depot. It's also a, a good choice. You don't want to use hardware store, you know, the typical zinc plated stuff because it will just simply rust up in very short order. A few words about the split washer versus the nylock. Uh, nylocks are popular among certain manufacturers. Uh, we personally use them and, and, and find nothing wrong with them. But uh, as, a, as a climber, you really don't want to be using these on the U-bolts on the that hold the tower to the actual mass, or hold the antenna to the actual mass, in my opinion, because it's just a total P-I-T-E. Proper tightening. All right, I have, a, I have a number of clients over the years who have asked me, are you going to tighten all my bolts with, or nuts with a torque wrench? And I just simply glibly say no. Because after you know 50 years of doing this, I know how much to tighten things, and I've actually put a torque wrench on them afterwards. And lo and behold, they're pretty darn close to those torque specifications. So I don't feel that it's really necessary. I do recommend that people make themselves familiar with this. It's a typical bolt chart. Uh, you should be able to identify a bolt just by you know looking at the markings uh, in, in on the head. For instance, you should know that you know uh, number eight or, or, or number excuse me number I, you know with the eight or with the six little check marks there on the on the hex head is a grade eight bolt. You should be able to identify a grade five. You should be able to identify, uh, you know, grade one hardware has no mark that sort of thing. It would be useful if you get you know if you get familiar with that, because quite often I see people show up. Uh, I show up at clients and they come out with a coffee can of nuts and bolts and boy they're all mixed up and you want to try to be consistent with everything uh, for instance if I'm going to put up a big 40 meter Yagi I'm going to be wanting to use you know everything's going to be grade 8 or everything's going to be grade 5 I don't want to mix things up all right what to do on installation day GD will talk here well first of all who's in charge and if you're if you've ever been on a tower it's very frustrating when you don't realize that the folks down down below you don't realize who is in charge. The climbers are always in charge. They're up there. They're taking the risk. Their lives depend on people doing the right things at the right time. It's always good to have a plan <clears throat> and make sure everybody knows what the plan is. One, one of the things Don and I spend a lot of time doing, and, and sometimes clients kind of think, well, what, why is he wasting his time just looking around? Well, quite often we're just trying to figure out how are we going to do this. We pre-visualize 
how we how we will do something, whether it be tram an antenna up the tower, or just even just put tower sections together, build guide wires, etc. We're always thinking ahead, one step or two steps or even three steps. You want to make sure all of your helpers know what the plan is, and that's where we get into the tailgate meeting before before anything happens, before anybody goes in the air. We all talk about what's going to be done. What are the issues in terms of safety if there are some? Sometimes you've got a close by power lines. Sometimes you've got close in trees. Sometimes you're using, um, let's say you're using a car or, or, or a lawn tractor to pull something up, which is not the preferred method, by the way. And you, know, you want to talk these things through. Because quite often, a climber gets up in the air. He cannot hear what people are saying on the ground. And conversely, unless the climber yells, they may not hear him as well. So you want to participate. You want to anticipate what might go wrong, and be ready. And be ready for when it does. Okay. So what is a good ground crew? The, if if they really know what they're doing, or if they've been taught what to do, they will stage and, and organize the materials as they are needed at the base of the tower. All too often, you know, sometimes we forget things. And if you think ahead and you get it organized and you have everything where it belongs, things will go much more quickly and much more smoothly. Follow directions. If the climber says something to do something, he doesn't, it doesn't mean two minutes from now. He probably means immediately because, again, your life is at risk. If you don't feel comfortable climbing, I'm, I'm just going to make this a general comment. I would have said this earlier if I had been here. Don't do it. Get somebody who is a professional or somebody who feels much more comfortable with the task at hand. Everybody should be wearing a hard hat on the ground. We all drop things when we're on towers, whether it be a wrench, whether it be a nut and bolt, something is going to come flying down to the ground. It's good it doesn't hit your head directly or some other part of your body. Again, also work gloves, ropes, cables. Things become slippery, and, rub, and gloves, proper gloves will help uh, mitigate that issue. And the final thing is, if you're on the ground, and I know it's sometimes a little bit, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, boring. Boring. That's the word I'm looking for. you got to still stay attentive. It's not the time to bring out your cell phone and do your email. You should really should be there for the task at hand. Please pay attention. Okay, a few words about tramming. Uh, probably the first thing to do is to get a solid definition of it. Uh, people think that trolleying is the same thing, and it's not. Trolleying differs from tramming by the simple fact that you happen to have a trolley device, i.e. something that rides along on some cables, usually two cables. And I don't like trolleying because I've always found it very, very difficult and time consuming to get the tension exactly right on both of the trolley lines so that things go up straight. So tramming simply means that you have a dedicated line or a rope, depending on the weight of the object you're going to pull up. We use 316 CHS for the big stuff, or we use rope for smaller things, upon which the load or the antenna rides, and it's pulled aloft by another or an, another separate rope. That load rides on a pulley, which you have turned upside down on the rope, or some of us have what's called a double pulley, uh, which is manufactured by the Petzl folks. And uh, it's a device that's actually designed specifically to do this sort of tram work. You see them used a lot in the uh, you know tram runs where you fly through the trees at, at, at uh, some you know parks. Rigging for tramming takes time, but the results are certainly worth the effort. And once you've done a tram job successfully, you won't ever want not to tram. It is a, It can be really neat to see a big Yagi go up in the air. The and we have a picture possible, coming up. Uh, yes, we do. There are alternatives. If you absolutely positively cannot tram something up, there are some options. You can corkscrew the antenna into place, or you can build it up in the air, uh, specifically on something called a PVRC mount, or you can do a straight lift, 
which means that you take the guy wires off, pull the tower up, and as you get at each guy station, you put them, you put them back, of course. Here we are tramming AA4 VVs, C19XR up to 100 feet, just the other day. One of the secrets to tramming success is this device here. It's, uh, I believe, Glenn Ratman who came up with the uh, moniker of a tiller, which is exactly what it is. It's just simply a piece of angle, and it, uh, the pull rope gets attached to it. And you can easily imagine or visualize that this keeps the elements aligned toward the tower. If you just try pulling it up with that, sometimes the elements will yaw from side to side. Okay, if you have to corkscrew, that just simply means that what you do is you take the antenna and twist and turn and lift above the guy wires. And here I am putting up a high gain 105 above the top set of guys and above a Cushcraft XM240 at KAPO up in Maine. This is an example of a PVRC mount. It's uh, right here in North Carolina for KF4TP's step IR. Obviously, you can see once you put the antenna up on that plate that it can rotate, twist, and tilt, and so on. Or you can do the work with a crane. Isn't that scary? Isn't that expensive? Or, gosh, isn't that dangerous? We hear that line a lot. Actually, it's fun. I really like working with big stuff. It's possibly less expensive than doing things the old-fashioned way, by hand. And it's certainly safer and most often faster. Uh, we put up 150 feet of uh, 55G for a client. We had the tower set in seven minutes, which uh, the, I told the client we could do it in less than 10. He didn't believe me. We could do it in 10 minutes or less. He didn't believe me. We should have bet large sums of money. But uh, sometimes it's necessary. And why is it necessary? Well, here's why. This is lowering half of 180 feet of 45G in one fell swoop. Pretty hard to do with a couple of guys on some ropes. Or here we are installing an 80-foot high rod self-supporting tower, the base section alone, over a thousand pounds, down at W1MBB in Florida. A few words about working with concrete because it comes up. Uh, uh, one other comment before you go on, Don. One more one comment about cranes. The, the price of a crane per hour will vary all over the place. It could be $125 an hour. It could be $250 an hour. It all depends on your local area and what, what, how busy your crane operators are. Yeah, what area. the local economy is like. That's right. So don't think it's out of your reach. It definitely is within your reach, especially if you can get them to agree to a four-hour minimum rather than an eight-hour minimum, because most of these jobs can be done in four hours. Exactly. I have a local crane company here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, their, their rate, they, they do have a four-hour minimum, and their rate is $95 an hour. The guy told me that, and I, you know, burned my jeans getting my wallet out. Uh, obviously, that, that brings many, many jobs into the realm of possibility. And from an installer standpoint, we, we pre much prefer using mechanization than having to pull something up with a rope. I mean, again, the, the focus here is safety, and it's so much right. safer. It's so much, fa it's so much faster, and it's so much safer. Anyway, just a few quick words about concrete. A variety of tools are needed to do concrete work. I mean, you, you get into woodworking, you get into metalworking, you, you're playing with water, you got concrete finishing tools, and so forth. But you're never going to mix. Preferably, you're never going to mix the concrete yourself. You're going to be dealing with ready mix. Uh, and easily, you know, you, you get the truck to drive up, the guy helps you get it in the hole. The part that most people don't understand is that proper curing is crucial to concrete success. It takes 28 days for concrete to reach its full strength. Keeping new concrete damp while it's curing is helpful. Concrete does not dry out, by the way, it cures. And so you should add that curing time to your project schedule as you go along. All right, let's get into tower guy anchors. Once again, magic word is three. There are only three acceptable choices. Dead man anchors, and you'll find them from most manufacturers. They'll come up with a design. 
You have screw and earth anchors. Again, the manufacturer will approve the ones that you should be able to use or should be using. And you have elevated guide posts. Now you're going to be making these yourself because you can't go out and buy these. So once again, it behooves you to get a professional engineer to come up with an approved or you know acceptable design. Yeah, and typically they're they're made out of well casing pipe and or I beams. Correct. Unacceptable choices. Again, we're mentioning these because we have all seen and experienced these. Towers guide to trees. Towers Guide to Fence Posts, Towers Guide to Trailer Tie-Down Anchors, the screw on that, by the way, is about an inch in diameter, Building Walls, Abandoned Cars and Trailers, and so on and so on and so on. It, it just gets kind of silly. This is an example of a dead man anchor. All it really is is a large chunk of concrete buried in the ground. Very fast and easy, relatively economical. This will be about a yard, yard and a half of concrete and uh, relatively easy to put down. And you'll notice it's typically on about a 45 degree Five angle. degree angle, right. This is what's called an expanding earth anchor. It's maybe difficult to tell from this picture because I should probably have one that's exploded. But a 5 h diameter rod goes through that hole in the top and then once it's down in the hole in the ground you smack that with a sledgehammer and the anchor literally quote explodes. Those spikes go out into undisturbed soil and you are not going to pull that out of the ground. John mentioned I-beams. These are elevated guide posts installed at K9CT, all designed by Hank Lonberg at, KR, at KR7X, Lonberg Design Group. And uh, these are down on the ground, I believe, five, five and a half feet. And that's an uh, eight-inch I-beam. And that's all Craig is using out there. Very nice. And it's, it's about eight, tall, eight feet tall. Now, obviously, when you get talking about elevated guideposts, it would be remiss if we didn't say they will slow down installation because obviously, anytime you have an elevated guidepost, you're now going to be working on that guidepost, i.e., you're going to be working on those uh, EQ on plates that are welded on there on a ladder, and that slows you down. But in Craig's case, he wanted this field that the, his, his towers are located in to still be arable or tillable by the farmer. And so obviously, you know, you can get very close to that and drive right by it with your tractor. Okay, go ahead. Okay. One of the things that obviously will slow you down is when you drop things. So it's always good to have spare nuts and bolts either in your pockets or in a bucket or someplace readily available so you can ask for them when you need them. One of the other things that we often find is we need rope. Quite often we, we get to a site and, and, and the antenna is at such size or the wind is blowing so hard, have, having a, a rope to stabilize the antenna as it's going up is very helpful. Other things, coax connectors, additional or spare shackles, thimbles, preforms. Again, all the materials you've used to build the system, the antenna system or the, the tower system, having one or two or three pieces extra is always helpful. You really don't want to have to take the time to drive down to Lowe's or Home Depot if in fact they have the parts you need. And if it's like 20 miles away, of course you can see what kind of delay that would put into the, into the job. Now, we, we encourage people to keep a station notebook, including all the design information for the towers, for the antennas, for the cabling, as well as measurements over time. So you can see what happens with your system. Is the performance the same on day, day one, a year from now as it was on day one? Have, have SWR uh, readings changed? Have, have uh, tension, tensioning of the guy wires changed? These are all things you can keep note of. And another big thing is control wiring. At NR5M, there are literally dozens of control wires coming into a shed. If you don't have a, a, a good book that tells you how this thing is wired, if you'll, never, you'll never remember. Let's just put it that. We're all getting older. You've got to write it down. Go ahead, exactly. Go. Some other things to consider. We like to mount our stack, back, stack match boxes at ground level. There's an obvious reason for that. It prevents, uh, well, it, it, it prevents having to climb to work on them. 
we follow, or I follow, we both follow, the lightning protection device mounted as close to the shack as possible. I like to use a Hoffman box. We follow the signal point grounding guidelines. We practice good connector weatherproofing techniques. We'll talk about that in detail in a moment. And we always recommend that folks do an annual tower inspection. It's simple preventative maintenance. And it doesn't take very long to do. It's one of, as I like to jokingly say, it's one of the few jobs where you can actually start at the top. I said I'd talk about it in detail. This is what I do. I begin with a Teflon wrap. This is not pipe threading tape, but it's a mil spec tape. It's, uh, I think, uh, seven mils thick. It's uh, very, very uh, rugged stuff, and it, is, it conforms to any shape. It's one of the few things that will actually uh, help weatherproof uh, rotator cables or uh, industrial cables that you sometimes find. Uh, not, not industrial cables, but uh, military connectors. And then um, over that is a layer of Scotch 130C, which is just simply linerless rubber. You overlap it one half of the tape width. Then there are two layers, again, overlapped one half tape width of Scotch 88, which is the tape I prefer, or Scotch 33. I like the 88 just because it's a half mil thicker than 33. And I've never had any known water ingress issues that I know of. Okay, we're going to go through this quickly because we're getting short on time. These are some tool tips. This is a simple scale. You can buy this at Walmart in the sporting goods department. It's uh, $4. This is, this, this is how we dynamically balance the beam. Uh, we just lift the beam up in the center, uh, as close to the boom to mass plate as possible, and then pull down on the lighter end, read off the, the, the weight on the scale, and then put that, that amount of weight in the opposite end of the boom. This is a, that same 105 that was installed at KPO. This is a, just, a, I think this is three pounds of uh, excess ground rod material held in place with some polyurethane expanding foam. Balance that antenna, you put the cap over it. It's still up there to this day, working fine. Gear wrench tools are worth your consideration because they speed up your work considerably. This is a ratcheting box end wrench. Boy, do I love these. I have. Uh, whole bunch of these and I just love them to death. Gear Wrench is a very interesting company. They make some very interesting tools. I think they're worthy. Other things that are worth looking at are their X-beam wrenches. Again, they have some standard or ratcheting versions. They make an X-beam needle nose pliers, which are pretty cool. They make a quad box wrench, which I don't use in the tower, but I always have one in the truck that has four sizes of wrench in one handle. And they make some pass-through ratchets that are pretty neat as well. Our, our, our tool that gets used probably on every single job for a whole variety of things, whether it's tightening coax connectors or you know, just holding stuff, is the Craftsman Robo Grip pliers. They're just a really, really neat tool. A Great for ratchet, preforms. Uh, yeah, they're used. It's the, the, the tool of choice to, to finish the preform at the very end, which is sometimes difficult to do by you know, your thumb and finger if you've done 20 or 30 of them in a row, your thumb is raw, so you use the robo grip. I never thought this tool would be as useful as it is. It's now made, it used to be just made by Husky, but it's now made and sold by a variety of folks, and it's sometimes the only way to access a nut is by rotating the handle, not turning it. And clever little gadget. You, again, put it in the toolbox. You don't use it every day, but when you need it, you got it. A clever tool that I really, really like is what's called the Dix Wixy gauge. It's a digital angle gauge. Use it on a, on a tapered tower, i.e. something like that pie rod you saw us put up. The tower tapers, you know, three degrees as it goes up, uh, basically three degrees, I think, every foot. Whoa. And uh, you put this on the three legs, and if they match, you know your, your tower is plumb. Pretty cool. It's used to set a saw blade, but you can also use it for this. It's a neat little gadget. The miracle cure for rusted, stuck, and stubborn hardware is, of course, PB Blaster penetrating catalyst, they call it, and it's truly a great, great tool. One of our jobs that we encounter, of course, is taking stuff down, and uh, if it doesn't come apart with an application of PV Blaster, it's likely not coming apart. This is not your mother's WD-40. This is the real deal. Right. People always ask me about rope, and I can recommend uh, rope pretty easily. 
I prefer double braided Kern mantle type rope, half inch diameter preferred. The pulleys that we use are these guys here on the bottom left. They're CMI rescue pulleys with either a two or two and a half inch sheave diameter. I buy that stuff from a place called Gear Express, gearexpress.com. And uh, one of the owners is a ham, so that's kind of nice. Tell him I sent you, it'll be fine. I could go on and on about rope, but again, time is drawing close. We got a summary and wrap up. You know, we're not putting up a tower or an antenna. You're putting up a and you're putting up a system. From the concept through design and installation, you should always follow good engineering practices. Always use rated and quality materials. Always make safety a priority during your construction. And this is what we call shameless self. Try that two or three. Get times it, get it, fast. get it right, Don. Come on. Shameless self promotion. This is just some examples of John and I at work. Here we are together, the K9CT, building an element for a W3TX, full-size 40-meter OWA. Here we are again, the K5MR station takedown. Whoa, I pushed the wrong button. This is John down at VP5JMs. Here we are, NR5M, 40-meter tower. That's, again, a 40-meter OWA. And this is me at KC9QQ on a trial on Titan putting up an M squared log periodic. We do this kind of stuff for a living. We're proud to provide clients consistent results at what we think are reasonable prices. No project or job is too small or too large for us. That means it can be a new tower or a new antenna installation, a rotator change out, cabling, grounding system, tower painting, tower removal or beam removal, silent key stuff, routine repairs and maintenance. We can help you. We've got a lot of nice reviews over on www.eham.net. Those are our uh, email addresses. I have a little website. Those are our phone numbers. And we have three minutes for questions. Right, Ken? No, we can, uh, we can stick around longer than that. Uh, not a problem. Oh, oh good. Great. We, uh, we will not get cut off here at uh, one hour. Okay. Well, do we have any? Yes, we uh, yes we do. So uh, keep your uh, slides up in case we need to go back. Um, I have a bunch of questions here, which I will start. And uh, if you have one that uh, you've been holding on to, now is the time to uh, send it to us. So uh, with that, um, let me uh, get started here. And the first one comes from John W2ID. Uh, what type of two-leg fall arrest lanyard is best, straight or elastic? Um, I see that there are different anchor hook types. Which type do I want to use for rolling 25, 45, and 55? All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, first of all, when you say lanyard, you have to remember you have two types of lanyards. Uh, you have what's called a work positioning lanyard, and then you have the actual lanyard that goes on the D-ring on the back of your PFAS. And I prefer, of course, you know, the gorilla hook on the end of that, and that will be, you know, the actual fall arrest lanyard. You want to remember when you're climbing Rhone 25 that that fall arrest lanyard, according to OSHA, should go at a 5,000-pound rated anchor point. Now, when you're climbing Rhone 25 and 45, the simple fact of the matter is you don't have that point. So you can't just put it on a you know this piece of Z bracing. You really want to put it on the side rail or the leg of the tower, and you want to make sure you get two welds of the actual Z brace, and then you're at a 3,000 pound rated point, which is about the best you're going to do. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, uh, next one comes from uh, Anthony into Kilo India. He says I have a 70 foot freestanding aluminum tower. It's the Universal HD. 21-70. Uh, is it wise to deploy the temporary guy ropes I installed to help with stability? Um, also, he says he has a full body uh, harness for climbing. Um, any other safety precautions when climbing this type of uh, system? Go ahead, Don. I know you love aluminum towers. <laughs> uh, we're not aluminum tower fans. Uh, they're kind of like climbing car aerials. They whip around a lot. Of course, you, you immediately have the problem. You've got a tower that's designed to be freestanding, and now you're putting guy, you're putting guy, guy guys on it. Uh, in your case, they're guy ropes, so uh, probably not too bad. Uh, but you know, by putting the guys on it and securing them, you're, you're putting additional downward force on that tower, 
And you know, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen specifically because I a I don't know what you got you know on the tower in terms of in terms of wind load, but uh, it'll obviously make you feel better as you climb it because it's not going to whip around so much. So I you know say okay, uh, just be cautious. I'm not sure what the question is about the PFAS there. Again, you know, an aluminum tower, you're going to have trouble finding that 5,000 pound rated anchor point. Actually, you, you won't. Know, use common sense, always anchor to a side rail. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mike, W3MC um, was wondering if uh, we can post that bolt of marking sheet online somewhere. Um, I'll uh, I can follow up with you guys. Oh gosh, and, just Google that. I mean, there's okay. thousands of them. Okay, there you go. Um, also, I should mention that uh, we are recording this, and um, it will be uh, posted on the WWROF webpage. So, if you need to uh, look at anything again, review something, you can go back uh, to the webpage and uh, uh, watch us. You you can fast forward through this stuff too. You don't need to to sit through the whole thing. Uh, one comment from uh, David regarding uh, crane operators, and this is in New York. Um, <laughs> crane operator is a separate union job from the driver of the crane, so one often needs to pay additional costs for the extra manpower. Okay. Uh, Jeff, VA3 India Sugar Papa, how long would you wait after concrete is poured to start installing the tower? Okay, what, good, question. Yeah. good question. Good question. And uh, also, what the MPA would you use? Um, you know, there are various various different uh, what's the what's the right term, uh, Don? The number four uh, for the concrete. You know, three thousand for the mix. Oh, the mix. Yeah, it's the yeah. it's the rating of the, of right. the concrete. Right. We always the, recommend a four thousand pound rating right. for you know tower bases. But the higher the mix, usually the the quicker it will re obtain a a uh, workable um, strength. strength. Okay, so you will find commercial operators, cell tower guys, they're using 5,000 pound mix and they're starting to stack just a few days after they pour. Now, they, they have a whole different you know, view of things. They are on the, on the budget, on the time budget. They've got to get things done much more quickly than generally we do. You know, so we're, we're usually buying 4,000 or 3,000 pound mix. Okay, can you, can you safely start to do work in seven to 10 days? Well, probably yes, you can. Would you want to take that risk? I don't know. I don't really like to take that kind of risk. I've been forced to from time to time. But, you know, it's, it's, it's workable, especially after 10 days. Um, you know, that's probably a reasonable amount of time to wait. What was the fastest other I've, the Fastest I've ever done, it's five days. Yeah. And I didn't put up the entire tower. I put up only half of it in that five-day period. And is it a guide tower? Or is it a self-supporting tower? That's a, a, another thing. I mean, if it's a self-supporting tower, you certainly want to wa wait longer than, than less. Okay. Um, let's see. I lost my uh, <laughs> lost my spot here. Uh, Don, someone wanted you to put the uh, slide back up with your uh, contact information. So um, why don't you go ahead, if you can, and uh, do that while we... Um, Take the there next question from John W2ID. Uh, which cold galvanizing paint do you recommend for painting towers and masts that have light rust? Uh, is there any pretreatment needed? Well, certainly you should. Uh, I, I think I do a little more tower painting than Don does. Um, certainly some wire brushing to get off the uh, the obvious loose scale and uh, the dust. Um, I use I use a a, a paint by, made by the Bright Bright Company in in Detroit. Bright Products. It's 65 or 69 percent uh, uh, lead uh, zinc, and it's about 110 dollars a gallon. It's UPSable. Um, I've had great success uh, on dozens of towers with this paint over the last 10 years. Um, you can buy uh, cans of spray paint from them as well. You can also go to your local Home Depot and find Rust-Oleum cold galvanizing paint. It probably works almost as well. And it's readily available if you really need to do some kind of a spot repair. But I've also had good luck with the with the bright zinc, and I've also had good luck right. with ZRC. ZRC, yeah, that's what they 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 paint battleships with. Yep. Okay. I know we're running uh, just a tad long, but we've got some good questions here, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a few more of these. And uh, one uh, next one from uh, Jerry N4JL. 
a machine shop uh, repaired, uh, prepared replacement EHS cable for my high gain crank up tower, but used copper or nitro press sleeves. I'm concerned with dissimilar metals. Uh, should aluminum sleeves have been used on the galvanized cable? Any thoughts on that? No, no. I would definitely stay with the uh, the, the aluminum the aluminum uh, nitro press fittings are not anywhere near as strong as the copper. And it's not full copper, it's, it's copper plate. Oh, it's yeah. just like copper weld. It's really a steel uh, uh, fitting with a copper coating on it. Much stronger than the aluminum. I'd, I'd say you'd be fine. I wouldn't really worry too much about dissimilar metals there. Okay, uh, Paul has a question. Looks like he's uh, getting ready to put up uh, a Roan 25 uh, 40 foot tower. He says, Can it be self supporting with a house bracket at 10 foot? And it looks like the antenna is going to be a, a C3. And he's also wondering if he needs to use a, a thrust bearing. Um, if you look at Roan specifications, it probably doesn't quite meet what they have in the spec. Um, the only one, the only you know, the higher you can get the, uh, the the bracket on the house, the better, obviously. It sounds like you're going to have about 30 feet of unsupported uh, unguided tower. That's probably on the edge of what would be acceptable. Will it survive? More than likely. Um, a C3 is a small, you know, a relatively lo low load antenna. It's, what, four, maybe four and a half square feet. Um, in terms of a thrust bearing, with an antenna that size, you probably don't need a thrust bearing. Uh, if you're using a pointy top, well, that, that'll give it uh, enough lateral support that it really doesn't matter. And a, certainly a ham M or a smaller rotator will turn that antenna. So, yeah, uh, you know, I've seen lots of installations just like the one you're, you're going to put up, and they survive a long, long time. But it's, it's, it is a little bit on the edge with 25G. 45G would be better. It's, it, well, there's no question. I have the, I have, <laughs> I have the chart in front of me. Okay. Uh, at 40 feet, you're allowed 1.5 square feet of wind load. But you didn't mention or you, don't t you didn't say where you live. Uh, this is a 70 mile an hour wind zone with no ice. You're allowed yeah. 1.5 square feet of wind load. The C3 is obviously more than that. Uh, the thrust bearing really doesn't buy you much. Uh, no. But, uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the spec right out of the Roan catalog. So, and, and where you put the house bracket is critical. I mean, obviously, if the house bracket is, you know, where many people put it, i.e., just 10 feet up off the ground, you're really not buying yourself much. It really needs to be, you know, half the tower height or at the 20-foot level before you begin to derive some real benefit from it. Okay, uh, Mitch is wondering if you guys do PE work. In other words, uh, sign off on engineering drawings, and do you work on mountaintops? Uh, uh, no PE on mountain tops. John's worked on mountaintops, yes. but neither one of us are PEs. Okay, um, question the uh, fall arrest lanyard. Um, any recommendations, uh, something that's fixed length or the elastic uh, expanding? Well, again, the, the, the expandable lanyard is the safety lanyard. That's the lifeline. That goes on the D-ring on the back. And then you have another lanyard, which is called a work positioning lanyard, that goes on the D-rings at the hips. Right. You can't, you can't work with just the, the collapsible lanyard. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, always four feet or six feet over your head. That, that doesn't do anything for you in terms of securing you to the tower so you can do actual work. That is, let go with both hands. Okay, here's a question. How many cable clamps or um, NICO press are required to terminate a cable and with a thimble? Well, in that illustration of the NICO press on the, on the truss, you saw that, or you, hopefully you saw, or maybe you saw that there were three dimples or three, uh, you know, presses in the NICO press. Each one of those is supposedly the equivalent of one cable clamp. So I would never put up anything without three cable clamps. You space them, you space them uh, three times the diameter of the cable apart. Okay, have you guys um, any, done any work on Roan BX towers? Any uh, suggestions, recommendations for working on that? BX towers? Yeah. Um, I, I guess, well, first of all, you know, they're, they are, they're, they're certainly limited in terms of what you can do with a BX tower. 
Now, some people, I've seen KT36s on them, and I scratch my head because Ron tells you, or Ron did used to tell you, that you can't have any more than a 10-foot uh, mast uh, boom on any, of those, on any of those models. Now, people do it all the time. And Is that the right thing? With. You're going to get away with it. Um, but when, when you start to see, you've got to inspect these very often because it, once you see the, uh, the rivets start to pop, you've got to start to worry. Don, go ahead. And I have seen that happen, i.e., the rivets, you know, breaking out. The, the, the towers are held together with aluminum rivets, and uh, I have seen those break, especially at the top. Uh, in fact, we just did a job for a client up in Raleigh, and uh, he had a big piece of water pipe up there. It was all VHF stuff, but, uh, you know, it, there was enough flex up there that the rivets, you know, had, had come loose, and he'd replaced them with stainless steel bolts, but it was kind of iffy. It was kind of iffy. And the other thing is, it depends They're very on how you got the climb. Yes, extremely difficult. And the other thing is, the bases are much more susceptible to corrosion, especially if you use the uh, you know, the slats that they give you rather than a, in a bolt type of arrangement. So you have to be much more careful on how it's mounted to the ground. Correct. In, in a in a in a got to keep it more often. Right. Got to inspect it more often. Okay, um, well, let's take two more questions. We've got others here, but uh, we need to wrap this up, and um, I think you guys have your contact information, too, if anyone wants to uh, uh, touch bases with you. A question from Dave. He says, I have a TB3 on top of the tower and a tail toaster inside. I'm not sure I completely understand the question. He says, should I relieve the strain on the thrust bearing or the rotator? Maybe you can talk in regards to so, Okay, you understand what he's... Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Well... First of all, there are some rotators that really that really demand you have the weight on the rotator to work properly, and therefore, the, the, what the thrust bearing is really doing is just holding that pipe, that mass pipe, in position vertically without without it moving around back and forth. Go ahead, Don. You can fill in that's the that's true. That's absolutely correct. Uh, once upon a time, not too long ago. Rotators were not designed to carry the weight of the mast and the antenna system. But in the last 20 years, all modern rotators, and that's what I mean by modern within the last 20 years, all rotators basically are designed to carry the, the weight or the load of that system. Right. So when I use the thrust bearing, I don't use it to support the weight anymore. I basically just use it as a bushing. And I put up a lot of, lot of mass, a lot of big antennas, a lot of, a lot of big mass. And I use two thrust bearings, which is somewhat problematic right. in that you have to make sure the, the alignment of that mass now becomes twice as critical, meaning it's got to be plumb. But uh, the nice thing about that is that if you ever need to work on that rotator, it's a relatively simple job to just go up there and because you've got two, two, two thrust bearings to raise that load up a little bit and then pin, you know, the, one of the thrust bearings or more preferred method is to put a a clamp above the top of the thrust bearing, let that support the weight, take the rotator out, and you know, you're good to go. But I almost never use the thrust bearing in the old-fashioned way of supporting the load so that the rotator doesn't do anything because they're all designed to carry that load. Okay, I'm going to fold two questions into one here, and it has to do with tower bases. Uh, your views on pier pin, setting the um, a section in concrete, and also using an old concrete slab um, with uh, you know epoxy uh, epoxying bolts in an existing uh, uh, base slab. Okay, well, good question. I, I'm going to answer my part of that. I personally don't like pier pins. That's what Mr. Cravelli <laughs> fell off of. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that. I won't do a peel print tower. Go ahead, Don. And uh, uh, the real problem with the peer pin is, you know, I, I understand the reason. I mean, you know, it's K3LR is one of the proponents of this. Why bury part of the tower in the ground? And, you know, that makes good sense, no question about it. But, you know, from an, from an installer's point of view, I mean, you put up the first 10 feet of tower, and, and you, now you've got to guy it. You have to guy it before you can climb up there. And... Uh, you have to basically guy each section as you go, so it slows you down until you get to the you know the real guy first guy point, say at 30 feet. And uh, but yet it makes ec good economic sense, but you know it's real nice to put a section of tower or base burial section in the ground, come come back 28 days later and just start stacking steel and you can start climbing it. So I like that. It's you know that's the 
that's the method I usually recommend to most folks and, and do, you know, 97% of the time. Now, now, wait a minute, there was another part to that. If you have already have a slab of concrete that is adequate oh, the epoxy, for a tower, right. yeah, the epoxy thing, certainly you can, you can drill it, put the epoxy in. The epoxy is stronger than the concrete. So you can put your bolts in there and uh, mount it up. Yeah, we just did that at K9CT. Uh, his rotating tower, the the you know the K0XG rotating base is you know epoxied in, into the into the concrete. Okay, super guys. Uh, my apologies to those who uh, have questions uh, sitting here yet. Uh, we uh, <laughs> we've got a pretty long list, but uh, we need to to go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, guys have their email address up here, so I'm sure you can contact them. Also, um, guys, I'll. I'll get with you offline. There's been some uh, questions about whether the uh, slides could be uh, made available and I'll, I'll talk to you guys offline about that. Uh, if we can do something folks, um, I will include that in the note that goes out once the recording that we have here is, uh, has been posted. So with that, uh, John, Don, anything else you want to add as we wrap things up here? Nope. I think that covers it from my perspective. I, I apologize for my technical difficulties this evening. I'm glad that uh, so many of you uh, signed on tonight from so many different countries. I'm looking at the list here, and it's amazing. And uh, everybody sees this greetings to you. I was, uh, I was hoping uh, Panera Bread wouldn't close down here at uh, 10 o'clock and kick you out. So that, was, <laughs> that was good. Hey, guys, this was uh, fantastic. I hope we can do it again. Lots of good information. Uh, certainly was a lot of interest uh, uh, from uh, all the attendees. And um, as, as, uh, as you said, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good audience uh, from, uh, from around the world. So um, thank you to the attendees for uh, joining us. And um, um, hope to uh, see you next time. I've got a couple ideas we're working on. So uh, you'll see the announcement come on up as, uh, as soon as we uh, get uh, additional uh, webinars scheduled. So with that, everyone, thanks once again for uh, joining us. Have a great uh, rest of the week, uh, weekend, and we'll uh, see you next time. 73s, so long. Okay, thanks, Ciao. Ciao.